Hey guys, welcome to the Summit Heights Fellowship broadcast. My name is Edward Crouch and I'm the lead pastor here at Summit Heights. And before we get to our broadcast, I just wanted to say thank you for joining us. If you have a few minutes today, check out our website, summitheightsfellowship.com and you'll learn all about our church. We have a great student ministry, an incredible children's ministry, preschool ministry, and we do small groups all over our community from Mineola to Quitman to Winsboro, Hawkins, even in Big Sandy. We would love to have you check us out one Sunday. If there's anything we could ever do for you, please take a few minutes, go to our website, fill out that prayer card on our website, and we would love to pray for you, reach out to you, or minister to you in any way we can. Again, thanks for joining us today. We hope you enjoy the broadcast. If there's any decisions or questions you have at the end of our broadcast, please reach out to us at our number on the screen or on our website. We would love to visit with you. Have a great day. Enjoy the broadcast. Well, good morning. How are you? I, th I thought we had a video going there for a minute. We started a new series last week um, talking about small groups, which is why I'm wearing my small group shirt. Yep, I got you back. Isn't that what we're supposed to do in small groups, right? Okay. Uh, I know some of you are like, what in the world? I, I remember growing up, I had certain dreams and certain um, things that I wanted to accomplish. One of the things I really wanted to accomplish, one of the dreams I had is by the time I turned 30 years old, I wanted to own a Porsche 911 Carrera. <laughs> so I, everything I did up to that point, I, I would collect Porsche posters because I drove a Dodge Colt. And so... Uh, <laughs> Wasn't quite a Porsche, but uh, I, I remember uh, at 18 years old, I had an opportunity because I had these dreams and all these things, and I'd surrendered to the ministry. And uh, when I was 18 years old, I decided to surrender to the ministry and not own a Chick-fil-A because I was offered a Chick-fil-A. Wow. Uh, and so by the time I turned 30, I didn't have a Porsche. I had a Jeep. Big difference between a Jeep and a Porsche. Um, and so, uh, you know, I think we all have those dreams. And I, I know some of you probably had some of those dreams in your journey, and some of you still have dreams. I'm a dreamer by nature. I, I love to sit outside and dream and think. And when the lottery gets to a certain point, how many dream with me? Anybody? Okay, I know I, you may be sitting here going, well, that's not very spiritual. Well, sometimes, you know, it's just good to dream, isn't it? And sometimes I dream about having a Corvette, and sometimes I dream about a bigger bass boat. And I think we all have dreams, and we know what it's like to have those dreams and maybe your dream is to have a job or an ideal job or run a marathon I cannot imagine why you would want to do that but that may be some of your dreams or be financially free or have perfect kids or live in a nicer bigger home or maybe start your own business you see we all have dreams in fact, some of you had a dream about what church was supposed to look like. And somewhere along the way, you got burned or maybe it wasn't a good experience and you dropped out and you've now come back. And, and we all have these dreams that are big. But here's, here's the big thing I want you to hear this morning. And I want you to, the, Clay kind of touched on it a while ago. You may think you're invisible this morning, but listen up. And if you're visiting with us or listening for the first time, listen to this because this is huge. I believe God has a dream for you. I believe God has a dream for us for me. And some of you may think, well, only God cares about what we're doing or who we'll marry or what we'll accomplish for our lives. And he does. But it, like any loving father, he also has these dreams for us that, that, that we would be happy and satisfied and full of joy, that we would love who we are. Because see, not only do I want my kids to grow up and one day move out and have a job and buy their own house, I want them to love who they are. I want them to love how God's created them and that, that they are a child of God and, and God created them and has a dream for them. I think God brings dreams about the things he knows that will bring us fulfillment. And for many of us in this room, we don't have fulfillment or joy. And I think it's because I believe one of God's biggest dreams for us is to be an authentic community, to be in real relationships not acquaintances, because those are easy, but characterized by a oneness, not only in him, but a oneness with each other. Relationships that are deep. And I, I gotta be honest with you, I think small groups that relationships, they're just practical, aren't they? Because you look across this room, there's no way I can be an intimate relationship with every one of you, right? Any more than you can in this room. 
It reminds me back in Exodus chapter 18 where Moses had uh, led the children of Israel out of Egypt and out of slavery and they were going across the desert. And, and if you know anything, you know this. There were millions of them and it doesn't take millions of people for them to start grumbling. We all know that where two are gathered or more, there will be disputes, right? <laughs> Amen? And if you've had children, you know if you have more than one child, shoot, you can have one child and there's gonna be disputes, right? Because that's just what people do. And so Moses worked these long, hard days because as he was going across the desert and they would camp and they would stay in these places and God was leading them in the desert, these people would get in fights and disputes and lawsuits and Moses kind of set himself up as the judge over everyone. And then Moses was out there, his, his family, you know, his wife probably had enough of it. So his wife went home to live with his the in-laws, if you've ever had to move in with your in-laws or you've ever had your children move in with you, you know there's a, that's an interesting dynamic. And some of you right now are in much prayer that they will find another place, amen? And uh, so, so this is kind of the dynamic. Moses out here, he's taking care of the people, working these long days, doing these disputes. And his wife is living back at home with her daddy. And you know this conversation taking place. Moses is working way too hard. Moses needs to stop doing this. Not, now, we don't know that in Scripture. We just know that's who we are, right? We're going to gripe and complain about that. So Jethro decides, you know what? The only way I can solve this thing is we're going to go visit them. So he loads up Moses' family and his family. They go out and they find Moses out there and they have this great reunion and they're talking and they're celebrating what the Lord's done and they're, they're enjoying meals together. And finally, Jethro looks at him and he says, Moses, what you're doing is not good. Exodus 18, 17. What you're doing, everybody say not good. not good. Moses was codependent on the children of Israel. It's good to be needed, isn't it? It's good to be needed, isn't it? And Moses was kind of enjoying that everybody was coming to him and the children of Israel were codependent on him. And, Moses, and Jethro just looks at him and says, look, son, you're going to die if you keep this up. And see, it's one thing to give criticism. It's a whole nother thing to give a solution. And Jethro then goes in and tells him, he says, look, 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 this is what you need. You need to divide the people up, because there's millions of them, into thousands, hundreds, fifties, and tens. As I was studying that this last week, he was basically saying, hey, go start small groups. <laughs> right? <laughs> now, it's interesting, thousands, I get that, hundreds, yeah, fifties. Whoever had that group of 10, that must have been a salty group. Amen? You ever think about that? I mean, you got a 1,000, they're easy, but somebody had to put up with those 10 people, right? Okay, I don't know where you fit in that, but anyway. See, the point is, the management of moving people into relationships can't rest on one man. It can't rest on one man. It's not good. So we believers, the church, we believe the best way to manage this group of people and this isn't all of us, by the way, is to move them into small groups. And last week I said this, I wanna say it again this week, Joe Fields, one of our elders, was the only one that said amen in this. So Joe, I'm counting on another amen. And I said this last week, once you're in small groups, I stop worrying about you. I do. I stop worrying about you because I believe once you get into a small group that your needs are gonna be taken care of. See, in the New Testament, we find Jesus praying for his disciples. He had a small group. I don't know if you knew that. There were 12 of them, 12 guys. And, and he had a dream for them. And, and we find Jesus' dream in John chapter 17. If you have your Bibles, flip over there. It's, a, it's the prayer of unity that, John, that Jesus prayed for his disciples. And as Jesus was moving towards the cross, he's not praying for himself. He's praying for these men, these group of guys that, that, that he's about to leave. And it's always interesting when, when you come to the end of life. And I've done a few funerals this month and got some more coming up. And what you find out when someone knows they're going to die, they'll usually gather all the children around or get gather their family around or gather their friends around and they kind of give out their last wishes. You ever been around somebody like that? And, and then here's how it happens. Once they die, somebody will go to the end of the earth to make sure they fulfill whatever those last wishes were. Well, this is kind of what's going on here. Jesus is praying. We have it recorded and it's interesting. He's kind of he's given his last dream going, guys, this, this is my hope. This is my dream. And he's communicating it in a way of prayer. In John chapter 17, verse 11, look what he says. His word says, I will remain in the world no longer. He's, again, he's praying. But they are still in the world, talking about the disciples. And I'm going to be coming home, Dad. Protect them by the power of your name. 
the name you, give, you gave me so that they may be one as we are one. Now look at that last line. So that they may be one as we are one. This is such a huge, significant statement. That Jesus' desire, his, his, his passion, his, his mindset was that he was praying for his disciples. Don't forget who these guys were. These were these same guys that he hung out with for three years that disappointed him and, and misunderstood him. And they were about to abandon him. And yet we find Jesus right here at the last moment giving his greatest wishes. Going, this is what I want for you. This is what I want for you, and I want you to have the same experience that I have with the Father and the Holy Spirit, and they have with me. I want you to have that with each other. That's deep. We read that and go, yeah, okay. But the experience of authentic community is so life-giving. And when you and I take a place in fellowship with him, and enjoying him when we begin to enjoy each other, if we're, we're reflecting what the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and that oneness that they have, that we can experience that here. It's mind-boggling to me that his disciples would experience this kind of life-giving relationship with one another. That would make their hearts come alive. That only God could do himself. And to really understand that, you've got to look at really what that relationship was between the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. You, you see them in Scripture in Genesis. They're enjoying one another. In Matthew, they're encouraging one another. In John, they're supporting one another. In, in Mark, they're loving one another. In John 14, they're deferring to one another. They're glorifying one another. It's like this big old ongoing mutual admiration party. I mean, what's not to admire about hanging out with someone that's selfless? That's the relationship between the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. They're selfless. They're deferring to each other all the time. They're not talking about themselves. They're talking about each other. You're awesome. You're good. You're beautiful. You can do it. Look how beautiful the Father is. No, no, no. Look at the Holy Spirit. Isn't that cool? I don't know about you, but I'd like to hang out with some people like that, amen? That'd make my heart come alive. i tell you what makes my heart come alive is when people come up to me and they, they go, dude, man, this and th this, and, and they're complimenting me, and I'm like, I start kind of puffing my chest out, you know? Is there something about being in an authentic community where people love you? You see, what's cool about this I understand that he was praying that for his disciples. I mean, he spent three years with them, walking with them in, in Galilee and Judea, but his prayer wasn't just for them. Look at it. He says, my prayer is not for them alone in verse 20. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message that all of them may be one, Father, just as you and I, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. This is so incredible because Jesus' invitation to give life-given life relationships were not only for those then, but for those who would come to faith. That's you and me. And Jesus was not just praying for his 12, he's praying for you. Let that sink in a minute. That's amazing. And he even knew the crap you were gonna do. Amen? Look at me all spiritual. Jesus' prayer was that his followers would experience a meaningful relationship, the same as the Trinity experienced. Qualities like mutual encouragement and support and love and deference and, and honor. His prayer. That was his dream. And as important as it is for each follower of Christ to give and experience this unique kind of relationship with life, the benefits even go beyond that. Because when we experience that with each other, as he is experiencing it with the Father on the vertical level and on the horizontal level, the influence of a watching world is watching us and how we do community and relationships together. And notice what Jesus' concluding words are in verse 21. I've highlighted them on the screen. He says, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. Do you feel the way to that? I mean, it's as if Jesus is saying that the credibility of his life and message in the eyes of unbelievers is dependent upon the way we as followers relate to one another. You catching that? 
Is Carrie the only one catching that this morning? <laughs> There's a weight to that. Somehow their belief and our behavior are connected. Sometimes you get upset with me when I'm in here talking to you about obedience because see, there's something about the way we do life with each other that connects them out there of them coming inside here into a relationship with Jesus. It's as if Jesus is saying that unbelievers are waiting to believe, but the question is, will they see us relating in this magnetic, irresistible way? They're waiting to believe, and I believe that. Sometimes they look at us and the way we treat each other and the way we talk about ourselves all the time and they're not going to believe. Remember those words earlier we preached on this year, John 13, 34 and 35. Look at it. Jesus said, a new command, I give you love one another as I've loved you. So you must also love one another by this. All men will know that you are my disciples if you what? Love one another. It's as if Jesus is saying the credibility of the gospel is at stake by the way we treat each other. Francis Schaeffer says, our relationship with each other is a criterion the world uses to judge whether our marriage, our message is truthful. And he says this, Christian community is the final apologetic. That God wants us to be in community. Why? So the world out there will know who he is. Last week, we talked about the fact that people need community, that we crave relationship, healthy relationships. That for many of us, we live in isolation. Even though we're, we're surrounded by people, and even though you have thousands or hundreds of friends on Facebook, we live in isolation. And that is not what God wanted us to do because he created us to be in relationships. We see his plan of moving the children of Israel across, divide them up. You can't do it all. The kind of connections that we need are not casual. Because casual connections aren't life-giving. So here's what I want to do this morning. I, I told Jake this a few weeks ago I was going to try this. And this may bust, okay? I'm just going to tell you up front. But I'm going to ask you to be very, very honest with me. And by the way, I'm not going to call you out. I'm not going to have you come to the front. But I am going to have you respond, okay? You ready for this? Everybody say ready? Okay, so here's my question. How many of you in this room today are in an active small group, raise your hand. Okay, all right, all right, thank you. Put your hands down, here's the next one. How many of you in this room are not involved in an active small group? I'm not gonna call you out, I'm not gonna bring you up, so please be honest, okay? How many of you are not involved, raise your hand, raise it high. All of you that just raise your hand, look around, okay? All right, thank you, now here's the, here's the, here's the question. Of you that just raised your hand, if there was a small group that you could attend, would you be in a small group? Raise your hand. Okay, now, some look around. Look at this. You see this? Okay, thank you. So here's what we're gonna do. I'm gonna start a small group in my house and all of you that just raised your hand come to my house. <laughs> and, and I'm not making eye contact with her because she's ready to kill me right now. <laughs> You see how foolish that is? You see how foolish that is? I mean, I would need marriage counseling and probably a place to live if I did that, right? And that's why Jethro told Mo Moses, break it down, son, so that it's manageable. That's why we need some of you that raised your hand first. And I know you love your small group. I know you love being in their group because you've been in it for years, man. But we need some of you to step out and drive a food truck, become an operator of a small group. Listen, you can still be a part of your small group, but we need some operators. We need some people to step out because I, I just saw like six small groups raise their hands of people going, yeah, I, I would love to do that. See, I'm in a small group and a few years ago, my small group leader took a bold, bold step. In fact, I want you to hear her story. We videoed it earlier this week because she couldn't be here today. But I want you to hear this story. Watch this. I'm Kathy Boyd. I have been a member of Summit for 15 years. Uh, when we started Summit, we went into small groups, which I was not used to because I was a Sunday school girl. So I didn't know what to expect. And uh, I love it because it is not just about the teaching. It's about the relationships and the families that we have formed. 
I was asked several times to be a small group leader and I constantly said no because that was no desire that I had in my heart. Um, I'm a teacher of teenagers. I love teenagers. Give me a room full and I'll lead them all day long. But a group of adults scares me. And about five or six years ago, the Lord put it on my heart that I should take over my small group. And I kept pushing that away because that is not something I ever wanted to do. Two reasons. One, they're adults and they're scary. And number two, Brother Ed is in my small group. And the thought of leading a small group with your pastor sitting next to you is very intimidating. So I had no desire to do that. I had watched two ladies lead our small group, and uh, I think what bothered me the most, and I knew I should help them, was because they had children from elementary school to high school, and I was sitting at an empty home because my children were gone. So each Sunday, I knew their struggle through, through the week, just trying to get everything done and then leading a small group. So I knew deep in my heart that I should help, and I just kept putting it off. And the Lord just kept nudging me through sermons, through songs I heard, through devotions. And so it was about three years ago, um, our current leader, she put on Facebook page, our Facebook page, that she just needed help. I don't remember what else she said. I know she had a long paragraph, but when I saw I need help, I told the Lord that I got it. I was supposed to lead this small group. So I texted her immediately and said, I've got this. I'm going to do it. And the cool thing was, also about five or six years ago, I was praying to the Lord that I wanted to grow deeper in the Word and uh, my relationship with Him. I wanted it to grow. I had been kind of stagnant for a while. And the cool thing about leading for me is that I'm a teacher by trade. So in school, I was taught that you really have to plan in order to teach your children. So I knew right then why God was leading me to lead a small group because I was wanting to grow. So I immediately picked a study, I ordered the book, I downloaded the material, and that's when my growth in Christ started. I got deeper in the Word because I wanted to be prepared on Sunday um, when I taught the small group. So it, it did two things for me. It, it filled a void of something that I had been wanting, uh, deeper in the Word, deeper with the Lord, and it filled a void to help someone else out that was struggling. So, I started this, teaching the small group, and if you're sitting there and you're scared, um, like I was, don't be intimidated, because um, I am a teacher by trade, so it is easy for me to get up and teach students, but adults, I was scared. But you don't really have to teach, you have to facilitate. That's what leading a small group is all about. I would start, I start the questions and the group just goes from there. And sometimes there's no discussion and we'll sit there in silence, but just know that that's okay. So if you're hesitant about starting to be a leader of a small group, don't be. Just, just ask the Lord to show you um, the, right, the right time, the right place, and uh, he'll put you in it. I don't regret it for one bit. Uh, sometimes I'm still intimidated that Brother Ed is sitting beside me, and uh, I'm, I'm not a theologian, but um, we have an awesome small group, and I start the conversation, and they go with me, and we learn so much together, and God will bless you through leading a small group. So please, if you're sitting there scared, don't be scared. Just, uh, just surrender to what He wants you to do. I tell you what, I'll be honest with you, I've grown under her leadership, uh, that every Sunday afternoon I get to go sit under that, and it's a challenge for me, and you see, here's what I'd say to you, I'm so glad you're here in these weekend services, but there's more to going and walking with Jesus than sitting here, so, sometimes there's more to clean up than what a weekend service will give you, amen, so, so I want to point out a couple of things Kathy said in that video, number one, small groups will help you grow, she said she was growing, that she started to grow. And there's so many different ways that community can help you grow, but I think Solomon summed it up best as iron sharpens iron, so a friend sharpens a friend. That she began to grow in this. That when we're engaged in community, that from the body of Christ, a natural product, byproduct is, is that we sharpen each other by hanging out with each other. And we become more effective for the kingdom. And the more people you surround yourself with, guess what? The sharper you get. So some of you dull people in here need to get sharp, amen? 
I'm not saying who it is and don't look at your husband, all right? So there you go. See, it's the goal of discipleship, that we become, we become more like Jesus. So see, small groups will help you grow, but here's the second thing, and she pointed this out. Small groups helps you through hard times. Small groups helps you through hard times. Do you know what called her eventually in to being a leader? Is that we had a bunch of young couples in our group and we had children because in our, in our neighborhood where we live, all the kids stay at our house and our house is full of kids. And we walk across the alley and we meet at another house. And can I tell you why some of you guys need to, to consider stepping up? Because there's some young couples in here. There's some young couples in here that are flat worn out. Can I just speak for their behalf? They have young toddlers. They're working two jobs trying to make ends meet. And the thought of leading a small group or leading one more thing or doing one more thing is done. And I love what Kathy said. My kids were grown. My house was empty. Why am I not leading? And maybe that's your question this morning. And I'm not trying to put guilt. I'm just saying... Could it be that God's calling you? Because what happened in that process, these young ladies that were leading our group at that time begin to heal and begin to walk through that because it's not a matter of whether hard times will come. It's a matter of when they come, amen? See, for me, four and a half years ago, my hard times came. And I, I was involved in three different groups. I had my elder team, I had my small group, and I had a men's group. And I'm telling you, when life happened to me four years ago, and I thought I was going to die, I thought, I thought this was it, this was going to be over, there was two of those groups that stepped up in my journey so stinking big that I was able to walk with them and them with me, that healing came. And I'm still in that process of healing every day that God has given us the body of Christ as a community of believers to help each other through these times. That maybe some of these young couples that would love to be in small group they probably wouldn't mind hosting the small group, but they need an operator, amen? And maybe it's time we step up. You see, I love what Romans 12, 15 says, be happy with those who are happy and weep with those who weep. See, a community brings strength and love on uh, uh, several all stepping in to help when needed because there's gonna be times when, when, when times are bad. And when times are bad and you're struggling, you need somebody in your life to look at you and go, listen, man, understand God loves you. He's not done. It's not over yet. I know it's rough right now. And I love you, man. Because see, when you're in community with people, you get a God perspective. And when you're not in community and you're isolating, it all becomes about you and it's everybody else's fault. Amen? That's what makes community so powerful. And listen, when times are good, we need to feast. Amen? You need a group of people that you can feast with and have great celebration. Amen? I think the church has lost that. Somewhere along the journey, someone has convinced you and church and me and church and church along the way that you can never celebrate and feast. We need to fast as much as we feast to celebrate, amen? See, friends like that can only be found in the body of Christ. And seasons good or bad, we're intended to share life together. See, here's the third thing. They help you through hard times, they help you grow, but they help you heal. James 5, 16 says, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be what? Healed. Notice that scripture says confessing our sins to one another brings healing. It doesn't bring salvation. Only salvation comes through faith in Jesus Christ. But we should never forget or underestimate the power of confession. Confession. See, confession to God brings forgiveness, but confession to a trusted friend brings healing. It brings healing. It brings healing and protection. It, it gets things out in the light for sure. See, four and a half years ago, I, I took a good friend of mine out to the lake and we sat on a, uh, he was a part of my men's group and we sat out on the dock and, and I confessed to him. And I remember through tears and weeping and crying of confessing to him some of the darkest things in my journey that I've ever confessed. All of a sudden, when you put it out in the light, it takes away the power of the secrecy Listen, the only antidote to the power of secrecy and shame, when you hide it, it's like throwing gasoline on the shame, man. And the enemy wants to isolate you out of true community so that you can stay in that shame and that guilt. And the only antidote to the power of secrecy and shame is confession. It's confession. When you confess to someone, it's like a weight you've been carrying. That thousand pounds is off of you. 
and the enemy's lies and that condemnation just are no longer effective because now you've taken what was hidden and you've brought it out in confession. And listen, I'm not telling you to turn around to someone you don't know and confess. That would be weird, right? Can I just ask you a question? Because these are the reasons some of us don't confess. We're scared to death that somebody finds out about us. They're not going to like you anymore. And that's a lie of the enemy because, see, I believed that for years. And listen, I'm a paid Christian professional, okay? And if I can believe that, how much more? Who do you have in your journey? Who do you have in your journey right now? And you see, that's the beauty of small groups. And it doesn't happen overnight. You'll discover that the struggles you have are the same struggles they have, just in a different form. And confession is that medicine to the soul. It's liberating. In fact, look at this statement on the screen. Truth sets us free, but patient endurance matures us and helps us to walk out the freedom we've experienced. You see, for many of us, we want freedom right now. The, the reality is it's patient endurance that matures us. And that comes by being in community and obedience to Jesus. So many of us continually struggle with sin and pain and regret that comes with our sin because we just keep going around the same mountain over and over and over again. <laughs> you feel that? You just keep going around the same mountain because you've never taken that which is hidden. When the scripture says, confess your sin to one another that you may be healed. And can I be honest with you? When I confessed that day and then a few days later confessed to the elders and I stood in front of them for eight hours, it was the most painful, excruciating thing I've ever done. And yet at the same time, the most liberating freeing journey of endurance that I continue to grow in maturity because I still have those men involved in my life. That small group of men that check on me and make sure and stay with me. See, that's the power of community. That's the power, the context that you have someone praying for you. I love what John, James 5, 16 says, that the prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. And listen, we all need people praying for us in our weaknesses, amen? Don't, don't kid yourself. I'm telling you right now, I don't want any good thoughts or good vibes or light beams thrown at me. I want the prayer of a righteous warrior of God praying for me, amen? That means all of you that claim to know Jesus as your Savior, you're righteous, not because of what you do, but because of what Jesus did in you. And you're surrendering to him in, in, in obedience and confession. Listen, that's why you're righteous. And you know what? I want your prayers, and I'm going to give you mine. Because the prayers of a righteous man are powerful and effective. And how can we pray if we don't know? That's the beauty of small groups. See, we're not righteous on our own. It's Jesus, and we need community. None of us can finish strong without it. That circle of friends, that was, that was Jesus' famous words at the very end, going, guys, guys, it's not, I don't have long, so listen to my words. And guess what? We're here today because those 12 men heard those words, and they passed them on to faithful men and women. That passed them on to faithful men and women. And today, there's a whole world out there that wants to believe but they're watching us and how we treat each other. So I want to leave you with this statement and a challenge. Look at this right here. People don't fall into community. They pursue it. You're not going to fall into community. You're going to have to pursue it. Well, Edward, that's your job. That's church. No, 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 stop. stop. Grow up. Okay? Grow up. I tell my kids all the time, you can, you can blame everybody you want to or you can take responsibility for your actions, okay? So listen, children of God, as your pastor, as your shepherd, let's grow up and let's pursue community. Now listen, I know some of you right now, you're in a bind, man. You've never been in a bind before. And for the first time in your journey, you're in a bind, okay? We're, we're gonna walk with you on that journey. I love you. We love you. But at some point, we're gonna, we're gonna ask you 
to, to, to pursue that. Don't get caught in that trap of going around the mountain over and over again. It's everybody else's fault and everybody else. If they would just do and they would be better. And, that, and let's get off that track, amen? And let's pursue community. One practical way, on September the 15th, we're going to give you a chance to join a small group. But, but listen to me. I, I, I'm telling you, I want to invite some of you that raised your hand first to take a bold step. To take a bold step. And be willing to become an operator. I love what Kathy said. She goes, it's changed me. It's healed me. I've grown deeper. She's one of the best small group leaders I've sat under. I love it. Would you be willing to step out? And just say, I'll be an operator. And let me tell you what you can do. You can go to a meeting today that our small group's pastor is fixing to have. In just a moment, we're going to take communion, and we're going to worship, and we're going to go home. But I just want to invite some of you guys maybe to go back there and, Jake, stand up. Y'all, y'all know Jake, right? Y'all met Jake Connor, okay? He's the money guy that gives them money talks. Remember that? Um, that's what he always tells us. Nobody knows me by my name. I'm the money man. Um, I'm glad he is. Amen. You know, he does a great job. Um, listen, if you want to be an operator, we're inviting you to operate, to go where the people are. And maybe God's calling you out. Maybe your house is empty and maybe you've got 19 kids. God bless you. And you want to host a small group. God bless you. Um, you're braver than me. But um, would you step out and be bold? And listen, some of you are visiting for the first time. Just keep coming back. This is safe. This is a safe place. Come as you are, but for God's sake, don't stay that way, okay? <laughs> and I don't understand. This is the best you can do right now. That's Okay. Okay, but we have an agenda for you. We want you to get well. We want you to get well, so keep hanging out, get in a small group, find out what all this is about. I'm telling you, some of you are hungering for that, and you're feeling it, amen? So here's what we're going to do. We're going to take communion, and um, we're going to worship together. And I'm just going to ask this morning that as you go take communion, that you would take a minute before you go and remember the body and the blood of Jesus Christ. Those last words that he prayed those things that he said this father this is what I want for our church that they would be one as you and I are one and see this morning you may not be one with somebody and maybe before you go take communion you just need to stop and confess and maybe go make that right maybe you need to just take a minute and and get your heart right with God and then go take communion if you're a believer in Jesus Christ as you take the body and the blood that juice and that cracker and thank him for taking our place that he loved us that if we believe in him that we would not perish but have everlasting life it's that body and that blood that was broken and poured out for us that we worship so I'm going to invite you to do that and then after we're done singing Clay and Beth are going to pray over us sing us out I want to invite you maybe to go back. Is that, which room is that in, Jake? Started at 1130, A104. It's in this back hallway. Just go check it out. Become an operator today. Amen? It's not as scary as you think. Give it a shot. Let's pray together. Father, I love you. Thank you for today. Thank you that we can come in this room and be encouraged. We can be challenged. Thank you, Father, that we can uh, even be offended a little bit. Sometimes we need our mind offended so you can change our heart. I know I do. So God, I pray that we would respond appropriately today. I know there's some folks in the room this morning that they love their small group. They don't ever want to leave. And I get it, Father, what they're being tugged on today. Give them courage. Maybe there's somebody here that has never given their life to you. They're still trying to throw good vibes and good beams and all that silliness. God, would you convict them this morning that they would recognize their sin separates them from you and they need a Savior. And this morning they would pray and surrender their life to you. So, Lord, I love you. We're going to respond. I want to invite our elders and prayer team up here. If you need prayer this morning, you come. Let them lay hands on you. Let them pray over you. If you don't know Jesus, come grab one of these guys. Let's stand together. Let's respond as we take communion this morning and pray.
Hey guys, welcome back. We hope you enjoyed the broadcast today. And if there's any decision you felt like God is leading you to make today, we would encourage you to uh, make that decision and to go online. There's a prayer tab on our website that you can go to. We'd love to pray for you. We would also love for you, if you accepted Christ today, to send us a text. We have a number at the bottom of the screen that you can text us the word accept if you accepted Christ. Or if you would like to know more about baptism, just shoot us a text with the word baptize to that number on the screen and we'll get to you, I promise you. Hey, have a great day and listen, if you're looking for a great church and you don't have a church home, come visit us one Sunday. We have two services, one nine, one at 11. We'd love to see you. Have a great week.